In my mana, in our rail, in a manga chair, in the queer, in a horrifa, here now to the forehead of two names, to the papa is the quarter of name, here now for you. Here pie to the quarter of your coat, here now, 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 here now. It's a great privilege to be here, and even more of a privilege. To be with Glennis. When I was first invited in September, when this was cancelled, I was coming by myself. <laughs> and now I'm coming with an assistant Maori Commissioner for Children. The dream that we had long held, in fact, we plead with the government, would they appoint co commissioners? Could we try to model co leadership? Government hundred pounds said, oh, I might be trying to tie our hands, Andrew, by appointing co commissioners. Possibly. I said, oh, possibly, certainly. That's what we want to do. We try the government's hand to a new model of leadership. They said, well, assistant commission, that's the most I can do. It sounds a bit of a demos, they said, in my daughter's terminology. I said, well, yeah, why not make a co commissioner or someone said, In the end, there was a bit of a paralysis. So, yes, we appointed as assistant Maori commission. But we're trying to act as co-commissioners in practice. I'll tell you, it's been a real journey for me and probably for yeah. us to work together and to thrash out, it's not been that hard actually, what it means to be co-leaders with a commitment to treatment partnership. And I sort of glibly said at the start of the appointment, maybe one and one would equal three. I don't think at least it's equal to three, if not more, it's deliberately working shoulder to shoulder with a colleague who's equally committed but brings a power Maori perspective. And Menace wasn't originally back in September even appointed to come down here to be part of this, but in the talk that I've prepared, there's a, a spot that I want Menace to be able to talk about a few things. But just so you can introduce yourself, Menace and respond, I'll shut up for a moment. <laughs> So nice to be here. So absolutely lovely to be here. And I know that none of you missed that side eye that we got from here. But here it's about six years. I don't think he's going to get this role is an absolute privilege, and it's one that I don't carry lightly. When Duncan Gala asked me what I thought my job might be about back in October, I said to him, what is easy, Duncan? I am now pauper to 1.2 million children. Simple as. And so the whole carry on about titles certainly didn't worry me. I know it didn't worry my name is either. And they tended to just get on and advocate and do the things that needed to be done for the benefit of fellow. So it's a blessing to be working with this fellow. We have, as you can imagine, lots and lots of hard case conversations. And you'll get a bit of a unique insight into those hard case conversations today. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. The Prime Minister or the Minister of Social Development walking into this lecture theatre and saying, What is your vision for New Zealand children? It's in the head of the head. It'd be good just to just have a little think, have a talk to the people next to you. What would be your vision? Because in the book of Proverbs, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, stagnate, wither on the vine, atrophy. I mean, what's, what is your vision? We've got a child and youth wellbeing strategy in New Zealand. I mean, it's world leading. I don't know any other country that's actually set out clearly under six areas of focus a child and youth wellbeing strategy. It's the terminology of the age, wellbeing. In fact, look at that slide up. Children don't talk about wellbeing, we ask them. They said the good life. Well, that's what we mean, the good life. So they call it the good life. In fact, they wrote a report on the good life. 
what just just talk about yourselves in that 20 second issue of man, what would be your vision and how to extend it for New Zealand's children in Africa? Okay. My vision is to formulating a vision for an organization and sometimes take longer than the organization to do. So what would be some key components of that vision? What would be your vision? I'll start with someone that will just pick on you see. Any ideas? Vision? Right. Well, I my vision went straight to Martin Luther King's I have a dream because I was there. So that was a child. March on Washington, make a difference. Yeah, but I've got a T-shirt on that. And people used to get so critical. They said, "Why don't you have a New Zealand vision?" So I have to have a New Zealand T-shirt with a New Zealand vision. So the great story about this. Anyway, other comments, man. Um, we were just talking about for children to be safe and healthy. We haven't even put it that in this image. I'm going to say I'll throw back to our Victorian past or to our children will be functioning at all. So we are preparing them for poor, but not now in any new news. We've been poor at really factoring in, hearing and listening to children and even government policy. Really poor. More comments. Um, good employment prospects. Good employment prospects. For independence. Any other vision? Time. Time? Time with important people. I've not heard it said. That was a four little word spelled T I N E. And we're really worried about it. It says, no, it's not. You spelled it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the children's vision to be a part of it. The children's vision to be part of it. While I was at Basket, you heard in the back row, you weren't asking any questions. And in the very back row, you're like, yes. Oh, no, I'm just saying, I'm in the back row. Don't want to walk out That's why it's so important. It's not like limits. Can anyone in the back row improve upon that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> any ideas? Yes. Positive attachment. Yeah. Yeah. On. Universal benefits. Universal benefits. Be free from the limits of society places. Be free from the limits of society places. We could just the last one. Yes. Reducing poverty. Reducing poverty. Yeah, I searched hard. I used to have a, I've got a Martin Luther King t shirt, but I think this one's better for New Zealand. This is a in a way, it's a New Zealand vision for children and young people. Excuse the sound effects. Right. And it's sort of something that I often talk about. When was this, by the way? New Zealand history? Last century, 1975? Yes. You know where? Beginning of the equal, the largest then march and petition to Parliament started with Dame Fina Cooper with her granddaughter, the Carl to Hubble. One great words take care of our children. And for me, the definition of child was under 18. I hope our names changed as Commissioner or Commission for Children and Young People. Because I mean, if they children, it's 
international definition, so we're under 18. Take care of our children. Take care of what they hear. Take care of what they see. Take care of what they feel. That's a great threefold challenge. For how the children grow, so will be the shape of our children. I mean, I'd drop everything. Dennis and I would drop everything to come here because this is nation building. I mean, an institute focusing on child well-being. It's in the year three, is that right, Go. I mean, what a terrific contribution for New Zealand. I mean, this is about nation. We're here because we care about our nation and we care about nation building. That's what Nelson Mandela was effectively saying. And I think for a day like today, the starting point is what's our vision? It's a good chance to think for you. What is your vision for child and youth well-being in New Zealand? What I was hoping to talk about today not quite in this order, <laughs> hang on, uh, make some introductory and contextual comments that might be about 15 minutes or so. Then to look at three aspects of well-being, and you've got some terrific aspects that you're focusing on at this conference. But for me, the impact of child poverty on well-being, Glennis has got some comments to make on the pressing need to do better for some Kamriki Māori and Pacifica children and young people. I don't like saying for Māori children and young people because it implies that one size fits all. And for me, understanding the prevalence and effects of neurodevelopmental diversity, I think it is a major issue. We see through a glass dome at the moment. History will judge us harshly in 50 or 100 years' time. Now we have sent a whole cohort of young men in particular to prison for many of whom the real issues are undiagnosed and unaddressed. Dyslexia, ADHD, traumatic brain injury, even out the whole spectrum of it. Speech and language difficulties. I mean, just people we'll judge us harshly. So there are three aspects that I think it's worth just focusing on from my point of view, but there's a whole lot of others that we could look at. Starting point, when we're talking about under 18 year olds, someone who didn't see the slide, expect if they show up. <laughs> How many under 18 year olds are there in New Zealand that child will be? And the first concept to issue is how big is the group? Do you know, do you want to guess at how many under 18 year olds there are in New Zealand? 1.2 million. Yeah, well, let's rather let the cat out of the bag. I was at a rugby club once and I went from 400,000 to two and a half million. I need to be thoughtful adults. But yes, this is the group. I mean, it's virtually a quarter of the population. I mean, why have we been so bad in terms of central government policy in hearing children's voices and involving under 18 year olds in policy and development? I mean, it's a rhetorical question. I mean, for a developed nation like New Zealand with a liberal thread through it, surely we could do more to hear from children. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's a huge group. And people often ask me, well, how well do our children do? In terms of well-being, what's a, you know, can you give a summary? It's probably impossible, but the best starting point I know is this, and it's really helpful and applies just about for whatever area you measure, whether it's educational achievement, whether it's uh, child poverty, whether it's health issues. But I want to introduce it by telling you a story about one of my days in the Monaco Youth Court. And a young fellow walked in and he took off his hoodie and he displayed exactly that T-shirt. I've got a second copy from the Ocala Film Market. <laughs> <laughs> and he just stood there wearing the T-shirt, staring at me, completely dissatisfied in the circumstances that I was his judge. <laughs> it was clearly one something better. 
And part of what we do is to engage and get conversation going and talk to young people. So this young bloke, I've seen someone lately, that's an interesting t-shirt. He said, oh, good boss. So I pushed on under the turn and said, well, it's early you call yourself a criminal, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, have you ever answered the charge yet? You don't even know if you're talking, you're getting way ahead of yourself. At this stage, his young lawyer got up and started literally waving his hand, wanting me clearly to shut up. I was in transgressing into difficult territory, but I boxed on and said, Well, I can't fuck the theology. He said, Sorry, I wonder what theology means. He said, Yeah, I do. It's about God stuff. I said, Yeah. I said, Look, I believe on the other side of heaven, as a Christian myself, there will be perfect youth justice. We can look forward to that. Well, I said, the bad news is today I'm in Monaco Youth Court. <laughs> you stuck with me, Judge Petro. And he just, he smiled and he laughed, and without being disrespectful, he said, well, I hope you get it right. <laughs> That's a good strap line for what we're doing today. Are we getting it right with children and young people? We have a two-day symposium on child well-being. That boy asks the key question, are we getting it right? And I told you just before I introduced the story, the best summary I've got about how an overview of New Zealand's under 18-year-olds is to say 70% are in conditions of material advantage. And they prosper and they thrive. That doesn't mean their well-being is taken care of, but it's a very good start. 20% are in and out of significant adversity in their lives. And 10% are in chronic, intergenerational, I think nowadays, at least second if not third generational, almost permanent, severe material disadvantage. That's about 120,000 people, young people, which actually is exactly the measure of material disadvantage that came out from Stats New Zealand a month ago. 124,000 under 18 year olds. Eden Park full twice over all spectators. That many children who know not having three meals a week of fish, meat, or poultry, not having two pairs of shoes, not having a rain truck, not living in a house that could pay an emergency bill of $500, not living in a house that's dry and properly heated. And that's a huge number for a country like New Zealand. Now, that doesn't tell us that 70%, 20%, 10% know different degrees of well-being, but it does increase the risk of poor well-being when you're really struggling with not enough food, not enough warmth in the house, not even a house sometimes. And that's a that's 70, 20, 10. It's pretty something of a light to my team, a theme through my time with Children's Commission. So really good starting point, 70, 20, 10. And we inevitably gravitate, pulled in towards the needs of the, of the 10%. But we never want to exclude the needs of the 70%. I was a young boy who was in the 70%, really. But I had a, I had a debilitating speech impediment. I had huge help. In fact, there's a speech language therapist here who just introduced herself to me. And I'm patron of the Speech Language Teachers Association. I mean, well-being cuts in a number of different ways. And for me, I was paralysed from ever speaking in public until I got to university. And I wasn't trusted to go to court, which is fair enough, I did conveyance. But my first advice ever gave over the phone. Someone rang, I explained it to them, and then at the end they said, oh, who am I speaking to? I said, oh, it's Andrew, Andrew, the surname Leecroft is a really hard name to say for someone who's got a block stuck, because you're supposed to constantly. I just couldn't get it out. Andrew, Andrew, then I said, stupidly, I'll spell it for you, because it's no easier to say. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, it's, it's uh, Andrew, Andrew, first name was Surtur, and so Andrew. And the person at the phone said, oh, you mean Mr. Andrews? Well, the heavy heart, I said, yes. I found out and rushed me into the receptionist to help me knew me. He said, you might think this is strange, but if someone phones me, Mr. Andrews, that's me. <laughs> she said, that's really strange. <laughs> and the firm paid for me to have a three-week residential living speech language treatment where you learn smooth speech with continuous airflow, 
and the hard consonants hopped onto the airflow. You learn to speak to start with at 50 syllables a minute. So I sounded a bit drunk in court, but you could say, mate, please, your honor, my name is Beecroft. And that's how I speak now. So I mean, well-being is going to affect different children in different ways, and it's terrific to see in your program how many aspects of well-being you're looking at. But that 702010 is a really good starting point. One of you said, why don't we hear from children more? And I think, you know, I think that is the absolute starting point. Why don't we hear more from children in New Zealand? This sort of video clip I'm about to play, it's Australian, but it's unscripted. Children have valuable insights, as this little clip demonstrates. If I was Prime Minister, I'd make it illegal. <laughs> Stay. What our friends can come home after university holidays or travel overseas or relationship breakdown, they can come home. We can't. Why can't, why, why, why can't you keep us to 21 or even often to 25? Because children and young people ask for policy change. They added an enormous value in that group. That's the first example. Second example, in Wellington, there was an underground bypass underneath a busy highway from the railway station. The children, particularly when they came off the train, but they never used it. And the accident rate didn't decline in terms of children getting hit on the main road as they tried to rush across. So they got the two local primary schools together eventually and said, why don't you use it? And they said, easy, it's dark and it's wet and it's not well lit and there's no pictures. So long story short, the council improved the lighting, fixed the drainage and got the school to do their own murals. All the kids used it because they asked children. 
final example, close to my heart, at Wellington College, I was involved in the football, the soccer committee. Now, it was really, football was very really popular in the years 9 and 10, then it stopped, 11, 12, and 13. We're no longer playing. We had about six teams in total. So we got two students onto the committee, which itself was then a controversial. And we asked them, your committee members now, why aren't you playing? And they said, it's it, because you guys insist on trials, hierarchical teams, selecting the coach, selecting the manager, tell us when, and telling us when we're going to practice. All we want to do is play with our mates. Let us choose our own teams and we'll all play. You should have heard the adults on the committee, but you don't understand, boys. You don't have any skills. You don't to go on to be first in You know, we grade you. That's how it's done. We, we've got a grading system from most stable to less able, and you play with like people, and that's better for you. And the boys said, well, you asked us. We're just telling you. So we tried it. We said, self-select your teams. We went from six teams to 31 teams. Now, they were still teenage boys without a frontal load, who sometimes turned up, <laughs> turned up by the steady stones or hungover. And the jumpers on the field, and we needed good adult managers, but they were playing. And we never thought of it. And the student voice unlocked a difficulty for us. So I'm a huge believer, nothing worse than a recent convert. And so, why doesn't every organisation? have ways of hearing from children and young people. In your organisation, what have you got? What systems have you got? We used to have a youth advisory group that attended to be the head boys and girls from around the country. Now we've got over 200 schools, we've got community organisations, we've got a vast network that we can go to to hear children and young persons' views. And they want, children want us to hear from them. I love that quote, I am a library, quiet but filled with knowledge. It's dumb that I'm not asked. All of you are involved in organisations where you have, a, you have a, a shelf of books, children, young people who could tell you how you think you're going. And we changed it, went into college completely. We had every sports team, they talked about, the kids said what they want to achieve that game, what their goals were. They, they thought about it, they talked about it at the end. It was something of a revolution, but it's not difficult. I mean, the starting point, that secondary school student, British migrant, I mean, how many have read in, in from cover to cover, it's only 42 articles, the, Convention on the Rights of the Child. And there's, there's, there's no shame if you haven't, but how many have read it? Yeah, you know, if you went to Europe, the whole lecture theatre would put their hands up. It's much more central in Europe than it is in New Zealand. But the Convention on the Rights of the Child repays careful reading. It's really worth looking at. I read it one week into the job, cover to cover. Three times, in fact, 40,000 feet on the way to a New Zealand's analysis of whether we were complying with the convention in Geneva. I couldn't recommend it more strongly. And the great thing was that the government asked us to ask children and young people what their views were on well-being. Never been done before. There's never a piece of legislation in New Zealand until the until the Children's Act that said in it, you can't, you have to create a child and youth wellbeing strategy, but you can't do it until you've A, asked the Māori community for its views, and B, asked under 18 year olds for their views. And it was really interesting because originally the strategy had four, not six, headline areas. And they were phrased originally as being safe and free from abuse being free from poverty, being mentally well. The kids changed it completely. They said, don't talk in negatives, absence of negatives, don't talk like that, be positive. No, love, safe and nurtured, having what we need. They turned it on and said, and they added two more. They said, we want to feel connected with those around us, we want to feel accepted by communities. 
So there's a fifth heading, accept and respect and connect them. And there's a sixth one, involve and empower. They want to be involved in their communities. I mean, children's views played a really important role. And we put together that report called The Good Life. And somewhere in your pack, there's a handout sheet. And you may not better read all of this, or you might do. It's interesting how much the 702010 has conveyed. But we asked them a series of questions. Green would strongly agree. Yellow was neither agree nor disagree. Red would strongly disagree. When I was really sad that only 66% of children and young people strongly agreed that they felt they belonged at school. That 70% only strongly agreed or agreed they felt respected and valued. I feel safe online. That's a really important finding. <coughs> Seven out of 10 only agreed they felt safe online. And only 94%, you know, that's 70, 20, 10 isn't exact. 70, 20, 10 isn't exact. But 94% only said, I have a warm, dry place to live. 90%, I feel safe at home. And there were some key messages that we received. So I'll just flash them up. I mean, the, the, the young people on that care experience group desperately wanted to be taken seriously. They said, if you remove us, keep us with our brothers and sisters. It's probably hard for some of us to know how tough it is. When I spoke to a nine-year-old girl in Potterua at a breakfast that was being provided by a sanitarium in Fonterra, organised by the school, she said, it's really tough for me. I'm in a two-bedroom home with 14 people. Hard to do my homework. Hard to get space for myself. And too much of our policies, I think, individualise and pathologise children and young people without looking at the wider context. It was interesting, when we went, as it were, to collect Glenis from Rekara Marae, Rekara, this is Rekara, Rekara Marae, which is 15 kilometres east of the Victoria. Probably one of the most isolated, marginalised communities in the country. It's a beautiful Sunday afternoon as we sat on the forecourt of the foreign hill. About 150 of Glenys' relatives gathered around her for photo. I sat next to her and she said to me, Andrew, this is Fano to me. This is my Fano. You think Fano is being your mum and dad and grandparents. This is my Fano. If the child ever has to be removed, we've done it and we've kept it in our whānau. Children can be kept safe and in their whānau. There is no need for foster kids. For our community, whānau is this big. And it's effective and it works. I was always really moved by the father who coached our son's soccer team and he bought the boots and the gear and collected two boys from a poorer part of Wellington and brought them every week to the game, to the practice, looked after them. Small way of, deserve, of people getting just a little bit more. And every child had a chance to write to the Prime Minister. She got about three or four thousand postcards, and she said she read it a lot. I believe it. I mean, children have very clear views. You could summarise it that way. I increasingly think we miss an opportunity in schools. I mean, schools are there primarily to educate, but for many, education is so difficult unless there's other help provided. I look forward to the days that schools become community hubs, service provision at school. Not by teachers, but by other trained 
to many people who can provide the support. So, what's behind it all? We talked about the 70 20 10. The New Zealand of today isn't the New Zealand I grew up in. And there is more marginalisation, disadvantage, where the width between wealth and poverty is much greater. Things are much more entrenched. It's very hard for people to lift themselves out of an intergenerational situation. What do you think are some of the reasons? Behind that 70 20 10, just have a talk to each other for about a moment. Yeah. Okay, there's a lot, but I'll put, I'll put down three that I think are contributing or causative of that 70 20 10 in comments from people. Any reasons? Any contributing factors? Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm a teacher and I'm a mother of five, and my children span from teenage to my youngest being 22 months. And I think a lot around how we don't still look after our mothers well in this country. And if our mothers are looked after well, our children are going to flourish, hopefully. It comes down to resourcing and choice. And I'm sure there's lots of others in this room that have had struggles like my head, but I'm lucky to be in a position where I'm resourced to make choices. Mm. And my father will be able to support me when things become tough. But often I think about those women that don't have the choice or the support and what that it does for the child, the more people that are involved in that situation, because they absorb some of that disconnect that we sometimes naturally do as parents. We things get a bit tough and we need a moment to regroup. And for some of our women in these really challenging situations, there's no one supporting them. Because we don't think they were silent breakfast a few weeks ago with the Peter Blackman's new institute released its most recent research that said the single biggest predictor of good life outcomes in the Queensies, a single biggest predictor is maternal mental health during pregnancy. And that's a staggering claim. That's the single biggest predictor in the single area where we can make the most difference. And, and my Study, which is not to said that first thousand days is crucial for teaching impulse control. And if you teach impulse control, most things in life can be can be covered. Any other comments about what's behind that? Just shout them out. Yes. Um, I've been to on the teacher, 17 year old teacher, primary. Yep. And, and 
Gonna share that lab. Oh, sorry. Ames. 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 So I've been teaching for 17 years. I've taught an ACPA primary school in and school in uh, program two for uh, adults as well in my home and home care. And we had uh, Nathan McCoy and Wallace talk about um, factors and benefits of so you a solo parent that could be considered a uh, factor. But if you had two living grandparents, that was a benefit. Um, so when you think, oh, am I doing a good job as a parent? But look at the benefits that most people don't have. So it's like if you have too many factors that can outweigh benefits, that's when you're going to start in trouble. If you have more benefits, say you've got grandparents around, you've got siblings, um, you've got partner, um, that's the benefit. And so what you were saying about the underpass, and I think that's lower heart, Belmont School. It was actually Jim Bauer. Oh, Jim Bauer, there was a similar yeah. one. It was, uh, it was actually a little girl in Belmont School, and she didn't want her little brother going into the dark, creepy. Tunnel, so she got her father with the approval of the school and community to paint a uh, fish, the mm -hmm. mirror mm -hmm. fish, just for her siblings. So it makes me think, well, we, kids are thinking of the well being of these siblings as adults we can do more. Tell you what, we could get a lot of ideas. I've had three here. This is all part of the introduction and context. And then we'll have half an hour look at those three issues. We'll finish at 12.30 and there's questions. I'm, I'm assuming we can take questions as, as we go. There's no contempt to court today. You can just fire out <laughs> disagreement, argument you've got just as you're doing. These are the three that I came up with. I think that's a huge contributing factor to well-being and it, at least it elevates the risk of the poor well-being. Just what you were saying, Mum, I'd now rephrase that, the first thousand days and the nine months beforehand. Parenting assistance. You talked about ECE, Mum. And the C word and the S word that I don't think we can escape. You put those three together, it's a pretty lethal cocktail. I think a lot of those stats in the 70 2010 are explained by these sorts of things. We could talk about all of them at great length. But I want to finish the introduction by saying that. I mean, of course, you need to do some flower tending as well. I've got huge help as a child. But we need to be committed to, to changing systems. Nelson Mandela put it well, but so did another South African, Desmond Tutu. I mean, you people have got enormous power, but there's two or three other people here. You can have enormous influence. Imagine what you can do if you get a spoke out in Christchurch. I'll get the my chance to read out what one of your fellow countrymen said. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And we can't afford to be neutral. And as Glenna said, it's a terrific job we've got. I've, I've never woken up other than thinking what an enormous opportunity, but responsibility. I mean, something's wrong in New Zealand in the way we understand and cope with child poverty. And I'll just take you through it. I mean, child poverty didn't happen gradually and slowly, it went boom, boom, as just a Russia would say after a hard tackle. 1991, mother of all budgets, bang. And within a couple of years, almost overnight, child poverty rates tripled. Pardon? Yeah, the trickle down theory. And you get Jim Bolger now saying, interviewed by Guy and Espen, if I'd had my time over again, I would have done better for children. Too many children lost out because there wasn't a trickle down benefit. Well, I was at the law centre in Mandarin, you heard about it in the, in the introduction. 61% of families in one primary school had no full time employment. That was early 90s. And we've never really made up that deficit. People say increased benefits, they're really saying make up. Get it back to how it was in 83, 4, 5, and 6, when the, when the child poverty numbers were less than 10%. I mean, that's the government's target now, halving child poverty by 2028. It's manageable and it's doable. 
But as that now, children bear the benefit of, or bear the burden, not the benefit, the burden of poverty disproportionately. And this graph I'm going to put up now, it's the most complicated you're probably going to see today, but you'll be, I'll take you through it, it's, it's understandable. This compares New Zealand with the European Union. So New Zealand's there in all the European countries, and it's measuring material deprivation, material disadvantage, usually done by doormark. Right? Asking questions, standards of questions, how will people are doing? Now, pretty standardized across the country. Overall, I mean, New Zealand's not the worst. It's, in, it's what, you know, there's a 10% overall that really struggled with material deprivation. But 65 plus. Why, why is it so good for those who are 65 plus in New Zealand? Not that there's anyone that age group here as old as well. Why, when you get to that age group, why is it so good? Yeah, they've been poor most of their life. They've got a house and they have index linked to wage growth, which benefits them. Universal superannuation. We have one of the best looked after over 65 groups in the world. It's terrific. No need to change that. But how is it? It could be such a difference for those who are under, under 18. Now, right there, it's not the highest, but it's quite high. But where the difference really stands out is the ratio between how well we do for the under 65 and how badly we do for the under 18. That's what marks us out from any other Western world country. I say my words carefully here. You can only conclude that successive governments have deliberately chosen, deliberately chosen to adopt policies that advantage rightly the elderly, look after them, but don't look after children. Our policies in New Zealand have deliberately been adopted in a way that doesn't look after children. Can't put any other way. You can't say anymore that it's accidental or we're aware of it or crept up on us. That's why groups such as Orphan, Child Poverty Action Group, it's been in existence since 1992. It's a huge issue. There's something twisted in our economic analysis that we can prioritize over 65, which we should do. I'm not saying change that. But why don't we at the same time equally prioritize under 18s? Why, why don't we? How can we have that? difference. If we can do that, why can't we do what Sweden does <coughs> for its children? Why can't we? When I was growing up in school, there was a group of countries that was Sweden, Finland, Norway, Switzerland, and New Zealand. The group still exists, but we're not in them anymore. And if you're talking about well-being, the sad and harsh reality is until the government Directs a decent safety net for all children, well being is always going to be impaired. And people like us have got a responsibility and obligation to consistently call the government out. Just a question Does poverty cause adverse life outcomes or not? What do you think? Just a little chat with each other. There's no absolute right or wrong answer on this, by the way. Okay, you can write a university thesis on this. <laughs> just three general 
just put up your hand if you fall in one of these categories. The categories are child poverty causes adverse life outcomes, child poverty increases the risk, but no more than that. Job poverty, we're not sure. So the first one, job poverty causes adverse life outcomes. Hands up. Job poverty elevates the risk of adverse life outcomes. That's most of you. Not sure yet, still thinking it through. Oh, you're sure, decisive. <laughs> you know, I, I think for myself, I think it's putting a big burden on those who are poor and struggling to say there's an inevitability that your situation in terms of adverse life outcomes. Well, we know that's not the case. We know your mothers and fathers and mother who bust with their gut with their children and prioritise them in every way and they thrive and flourish and they knew well-being, probably like some of the 70% in heaven knew. But it does elevate the risk, doesn't it? I mean, the risk of poor life outcomes, access to services, help, assistance, they are hugely elevated those risks and the, and the graphs show it. I mean, this is using the decile one to 10 as social scientists use it, not educationalists. This is decile one being the richest and decile 10 being the poorest in England. I mean, hospitalization for children for illness and accidental injury, there's just, you would know, I think it's called a social gradient. There's a clear social gradient. Sadly, abuse and neglect as well. I mean, some of it, you could say the rich people hush it up more. But there's an enormous social gradient, or there was 10 years ago. You can't help but be concerned. Yes, we've been outspoken about Oranga Tamari against care and protection system needing some radical reshaping. But I mean, the fundamental issues are deeper than that. But we could do better with Oranga Tamari, that's it. So that was the first snapshot to look at, child and youth well-being and poverty. Because I think there's a huge causal element in there. Actually, I rephrase that, not causal, risk elevation. When I prepared this talk, I was coming by myself. And and this hasn't had the benefit of months of thinking about what she would say here, and I sort of dropped it onto yesterday. Let's go down together and can you speak now? And a little bit unfair, but it's much better that Glennis talks about this than I do. But it's a hugely pressing issue. And I saw it in youth justice, you see it in care and protection. Now, 69% of those in state care identify as markers. 69%. I often thought that if a visitor from Mars came to New Zealand and looked at our care protection system, they would see, well, they used to see before they would see essentially a white concocted system administered for 70% of the market. And probably the Marsh would go back home and say there's no intelligent sign. There's no sign of intelligent life on Earth. I mean, the system was back to front. Why are we not more committed to buy Mari for Mari approaches? I don't know. But Venus, if you would like to say something. <laughs> this is why I took the job, actually. Because this is something that has been of huge concern, not just to me, but for many, for many of us around the country. And I've been searching far and wide to see who are the clever people in this country who can actually answer the why of this problem. The judge touched on it earlier. This situation is by design. This situation is by design. The current system is delivering for the people it was designed to deliver for. Current societal settings look after the majority. And we, as a modern nation, are committed to the principle of democracy. And so the current settings are doing exactly what they are designed to do. The question that is now being raised for all of us as thoughtful New Zealanders is around our tolerance for the status quo. And I'm hearing everywhere, in every little nook and cranny in this country, 
that we can no longer tolerate this level of disparity. Because the vision we have for well-being for children is a vision for all children, not just the ones that live in our house, not just the ones that live in our street, not just the ones that live in our community, but actually all of our children. Thoughtful and responsible New Zealanders are becoming increasingly concerned that this is the legacy we are leaving for our children. I took this job because I don't want to be part of that, actually. I think we have to do something about it. And so it requires a range of really uncomfortable and awkward conversations. And I had one of those conversations with some of my colleagues in the National Health, in the National Science Challenge in the health area. Willie Wood said to me in a meeting about three months ago, he said, did you know, Tui, that adjusting for socioeconomic factors, a Māori child born today will die seven years earlier than a Pākehā child born today. That'd be like a ton of bricks. And so I thought, hmm, great conference. I'm going to the symposium filled with clever people. I'd really like you to just have a little chat to one another about that. Why? Ask yourselves why. What are the factors driving that disproportionate outcome? Adjusting for socioeconomic disadvantage, a Māori child born today will die seven years earlier than a Pākehā child born today. So we take poverty and everything off the table. What's driving that? Have a minute to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> Space where they're discussing, just like you are right now, this very issue. So I just want to hear what are some of the drivers you think? Anybody? Clues? Yes. necessary to negotiate the European culture is, is not learned as well. <clears throat> it's, it's the language deficit in, in the language to negotiate the oppressive or dominant, the dominant culture. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes. It's also, um, there's a lot of research in the scene on Tala we have um, quantitative research to say we are Māori and Pacific are failing, but we don't have qualitative research 
as in why that is. Thank you, that's a really good point. Any other thoughts? Yes, a couple of that. Um, just straight up racism by doctors. Um, I've known people who've struggled to get the same medication that a white person could easily get because they've been seen as drug seeking. Um, who are in the exact same position as other people and have just struggled with that. So, yeah, thank you. Other thought down the front here? Um, accessing connections. Accessing connections? Would you like to expand so, on that a little um, more? Lack of access, like um, some, of our, some of our Maori families live in um, rural <laughs> places. Oh, okay. So they haven't got access yep. to um, facilities and they then haven't got the connections of where to go to to seek help. So yeah. it's a geographical disadvantage. Yeah, thank you. And we know that if we are not adjusting the socioeconomic factors, then transport and other things will come into it. But I really wanted us to think, to push that aside and actually think about what some of the other drivers are. My earlier comments stand. The system is doing what it's designed to do. And that's in direct contravention of Te Tiriti and Waitangi. When Te Tiriti and Waitangi was signed, it was an agreement between equals, and there was a specific understanding in Article 2 that actually you Māori and all of your people would get to just look on and live the way that you've been living for the last 500 years, in control of your outcomes, running your own affairs, building your own houses, doing your own do. But thank you very much for agreeing to make space for us to come and to live in accordance with our laws and our traditions and our ways. Now, what we didn't understand potentially back then was that my father's family came with a massive superiority complex. A massive superiority complex. In fact, in New Zealand in the early 1900s, there was a huge push for assimilation. That is to do my mother's family a favour by inviting her and all of her relatives to join my father's family and to become more like my father's family. And that ideology has driven an attitude that has seeped into our consciousness in Aotearoa. In many ways, many people in this country still believe that we're much better off if we adhere to Western ways of doing things. And you can imagine for a child of both cultures like myself, it's a difficult position to find yourself in. But then the analysis can't stop at our individual experience. We must look critically at the systems and structures that exist in this country to serve our people. And what I can confirm to you is this, that as a speaker of Te Reo Māori, it's very difficult to actually engage in any of the services built in this country in the language of my ancestors. As a child of Te Reo Māori, it's very difficult to even find a space in any ministry, in any department, that understands what is important to me. And in much the same way that we fail to hear the voices of children, you get this double down effect, or tamariki māori. And so I say to you, if this is a problem, a design problem, surely we have design solutions in this country. Surely the time has come to transform the system. And why should surely we don't want this disparity to be the legacy that we leave for all of our children? and grandchildren. I'm pretty sure none of us want to be the generation that built disparity and left it in play. We have an opportunity within our lifetimes to really understand these drivers, but it's going to take a mixed methods approach, ladies and gentlemen. 
but I have to be willing to talk to people as well as count them. We're going to have to open ourselves up to the idea that other cultures and other research and knowledge traditions also have value. And they've been sitting on our back doorstep for a really long time. I've long followed Angus's Braided Rivers approach and admired the work that he's done. And that is just the beginning of Mātauranga Māori in this country. It's got a speck in the ocean of what exists. Judge and I have been out on the road advocating for a bi Māori, four Māori approach to the way that we look after tamariki and mokopuna Māori in this country. Why? Because the current approach has failed tamariki and mokopuna Māori for too many generations to count. We have a Royal Commission of Inquiry into the abuse of children in state care. They have released their interim report and they are on their way to releasing their final report this year. That in itself is enough of a body of evidence for good thinking and good hearted New Zealanders to consider that there needs to be another way. And if we have doubts, or we're a little bit worried about whether or not bi Māori, for Māori is safe, or bi Māori, for Māori is appropriate, I think we really need to find a quiet, contemplative place and ask ourselves some awkward questions. What is it that's driving this view? Has it been informed by the New Zealand Herald? <laughs> Have we been negligent in our responsibility to do our research? Are we being fair in our assumptions? Or are we buying into racist tropes long perpetuated in this country through our media? That's why I love talking to people like you because I know you'll do the legwork and I know you'll do the asking. Our tamariki and our mokopuna, they deserve better. Much, much better than we are delivering for them today. And we can all be a part of a solution that transforms the system designed for one people. That was the great myth of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Hewi ko tahi tātou. When you understand what that means, Hobson's utterance was about unity. It was not a literal translation. We are now all the same people. It's an example of the very thing that I'm talking about. So I really want you to, I really want to encourage you, actually, to support us in this work that we've set for ourselves. This year, we are asking the public service to have a good look at their own systems and structures and to run a self-check for racism. We want them to be able to demonstrate to us that they are one aware of the issue and two, are driving the plan to do something about it. Why? Because our children deserve better. And on that note, I'll hand back to the judge. Yeah, I mean, we could reflect on that for a while. No more than this slide is a third challenge. Commissioned by the Children's Commissioner of England, Left hand side, the eight most prevalent, they use the word disorder, it's a bit old fashioned, I think. Neurodevelopmental diversity issues, dyslexia, we'll you talking about that, I think, later on. Traumatic brain injury, epilepsy, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Middle column, prevalence rate in all young people in the population of England and Wales. Even there, traumatic brain injury is quite high. I think there's a vast 
under count and under recognition in New Zealand. Right hand side, reported prevalence rates amongst young people in custody. <laughs> I mean, isn't that just stopping you in your tracks? They talk about a dyslexia to prison pipeline, out of school, lack of community involvement, with friends who commit crime, committing crime themselves to prison. I mean, now, Professor Chapman's there, I want to acknowledge you, we came so close to getting a piece of work done in New Zealand to see whether we could replicate those numbers. But we couldn't get the ethical approval. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. In Western Australia, the Youth Justice Detention Centre, they are categorically certain that 37% of the young boys in the young boys the detention centre have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which depends on a number of diagnoses plus a mother's admission to, to, to pre-birth drinking. They're convinced there's another 38% who fit the whole criteria, but the mother won't involve herself with the study. That's over 70% in their youth justice detention centre with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. These are all huge issues. Lunch calls began talking about a better policy era for children and young people. That's where you come in. I hope it's the dawn of a new policy era. In the words of that young boy, when you leave here in the Australian video, I hope you don't forget. <laughs> I hope you don't forget because you have the keys to the kingdom to bring about enormous structural change in New Zealand because that and nothing less is required. Tēnā kātou kātou.